黒表に竜がごとくあしらへん。Or just Kuroyo 2 or Black Panther 2 or that second Yakuza game that came out on the PSP exclusively in Japan was a game released on the PSP that came out exclusively in Japan in 2012. It was released after Yakuza Dead Souls but released before Yakuza 5. Just like the first one, it was made by Sin Sophia, who are the guys that made the incredibly famous fashion dreamer for the Nintendo Switch, and then RGG Studio did some other stuff, but whatever. If you haven't seen the video I made on the first game, then this video might be a little confusing, as for the most part, I will compare this directly to its predecessor. To start, it still plays the exact same as the last one, but makes quite a number of changes. The first likely noticeable change is that Kamurocho looks a little bit different than the last time. It's still nighttime, and it's still the same render of, I believe, Yakuza 4's map, but now they've added lots of lights and whatnot just to add a little bit more decoration. Also, this game has two unique things when running around the map, one of which was used in later games. The first is that if you run into a large NPC, Tatsu will get knocked over, and there's a chance that you can lose some money when you do it. This is kind of funny because I don't know about you watching this, but when I play the Yakuza games, I will literally run into every NPC that stands in my way just because I think it's funny, and so the developers added an NPC who counters that. Then, just like the other games around the time, walking in front of enemy NPCs that are just standing in place will cause them to run straight for you to start a fight. However, in this game, there is a special NPC type, being these Yakuza dudes, that won't aggro to you unless you bump into them. This then was later reused in Zero, where there are some enemies that won't aggro unless you bump into them, although I can't be for sure if that idea was directly taken from Croyo 2. Now, onto the actually important things. The game adds the ability to save anywhere you are and an auto save feature, being the first game in the series to do both. It also houses all of the saves in the game itself, rather than doing the PlayStation OS saves like the first game did. It does mean that saving the game is incredibly slow compared to how it was in Croyo 1, but still, it's way better than only saving at specific points. There's also now a certain boy for you to explore in the game, which was probably done intentionally considering Yakuza 1 and Kuroyo 1 were just Kamurocho, and now Yakuza 2 and Kuroyo 2 both have Soten Bori as well. This was also the first game to let you freely change costumes whenever you want, and then became the only game to do that until Like a Dragon Ishin came out in 2023. Now then, in terms of combat differences, this game still has the same fighting styles, combos, and heat actions, so the changes come in the form of a lot of balance changes. To start, Tatsuya's stats are now increased by allocating skill points, which you earn every time you level up. First game had a similar thing, but instead of skill points, you instead had to spend money towards each stat. Pretty sure also that this added toughness, which is essentially defense. Fighting styles now also have more varied benefits and downsides compared to the first. For example, the default fighting style has increased heat action damage, but it now has a downside of lowered stamina compared to the first game where it started with nothing, then gained three benefits as you leveled it up. Grabs have also been nerfed, but also kind of buffed. In the first game, you could grab whenever you wanted, and neither you nor the enemies could ever realistically break out of them, although sometimes the game decided not to be a bitch and would actually give you more than one frame to try and break out of it. Because I can mash pretty fast, but not that fast. But now, enemies will almost Always break out of your grabs, so long as you don't grab them after they've been knocked down. When you or an enemy are knocked onto one knee, you can both be grabbed and can't mash out unless you or the enemy turns your brains off and don't throw at all. Grab attacks have also been changed slightly. In the last game, when you press triangle, circle, or square after a grab, you'll do a different throw attack depending on which button you push. When you press circle while not holding a direction, you still will do a throw attack like you normally would, but now if you hold in a direction, you will physically throw your opponent. This can be used for a number of things. For example, if you throw someone into your teammate, you'll do a hit action with the Both of you, which is also weirdly in full frame rate instead of the lock 30, but anyway. Another thing you can do is throw your opponent into another enemy, which doesn't do much, or you can throw your opponent into a wall. The game features breakable environments too, and while it's not like Rainbow Six Siege or Battlefield 1, you can throw them into a vending machine to break the glass, or throw them off broken bridges, windows, and through broken walls, which will kill your opponent right away if they're at low health. After you break a vending machine's glass, you can then throw your opponent back into it and electrocute them for some extra damage, or if you throw your opponent into a wall and they get stunned, you can walk up and do a wall heat action. Speaking of these, Heat actions, the previous second tier with the yellow heat has been removed, although this is likely because you can do them whenever now. Besides that, heat actions are seemingly untouched. The camera has been changed around slightly, but only when you get far away from your opponent. In the first game, when you had some distance, the camera would simply zoom out, but would kind of struggle to keep both you and the enemy in frame. Now, when you get far away, the camera will sort of go over Tatsuya's shoulder and focus on the enemy, so you can still see both people. It's good in the sense that you can still see the enemy, but it does make it that sometimes it's a teeny bit harder to actually see where you are. Then there's also a slight change in when you press towards an enemy. Enemy and do an attack, and when you press away and do one. In the last game, you could press forward and attack and use that to start a combo and F people up, but now when you do it, it'll be an attack that'll always knock people down to one knee or knock them over completely, which then allows for a free and easy grab or other follow up attacks. When you press away and attack, it will now be an attack that always breaks guards, although this one isn't that good because a lot of the fighting styles aren't fast enough for you to follow up from a guard break. Catching or parrying is also much nicer to use because the input is back and circle. This was pretty goddamn annoying in the first game because it was really easy to input. When you're trying to block and move at the same time, which by the way is something you can do. Then there's something that I'm not entirely sure how to trigger, but it seems like if you and your opponent connect hits on each other at the same time, you get a little series of quick time events. If you hit all of them, which is extremely easy to do, you can do some major damage, 
plus it also looks pretty cool. Then there's also a mechanic where after you use a hit action on an enemy, they'll be shrouded with an aura that makes them just sort of not fight back, meaning you can beat them up more. Although with that one, I'm not entirely sure if that's something that only works on boss fights or not, and if you're hearing this bit in the voiceover, then that probably means that I tested it and it only works on bosses. Then the final thing I've noticed that's different in this game is that charge attacks will have different properties. In the last game, holding triangle or square would do a strong charge attack. You could unlock more, although they all kind of function the exact same way, so realistically you would just pick whichever one has the fastest animation or whatever. But now there are different effects, such as one that can't be parried, one that charges much faster, or one that charges up your heat when you do it, regardless of whether or not it hits, which is OP as hell. Now then I would just like to say that if these special effects for the charge attacks existed in the first game, god damn would I have liked to have known that earlier. Next we move on to a big thing with this game, which is comparing the street encounters to the boss fights, and in all honesty, the boss fights are cakewalks in comparison to the street encounters. I don't know why, but it feels like they did the opposite of the difficulty of the first game. Bosses still have their stupid bullshit heat mode where they destroy you and do a heat action, although in this game they seem to be much easier to deal with, and the bosses also don't use them every two seconds. Sometimes they won't even use it at all, because after a certain amount of time their heat aura will go away, but then they can get it back several times throughout the fight. But then with the street encounters, it feels like the enemies don't do what they usually do in this franchise, where they only make one attack you at a time, and in Kuroyo in particular, enemies essentially let you have 1v1s with the opponent, although sometimes another enemy might step in for a sucker punch. But instead, what they do now is just beat the shit out of you constantly, although I think the reason for that might be actually because of the fact that you can hire random dudes to always fight alongside you, and then there are also far more instances throughout the story where you have an ally in combat. But anyway, we now move on to the story itself. The first and most notable thing about this game's story is that Tatsuya has been recasted to someone who I don't really like as much as the original. He has a much deeper voice and speaks a lot clearer, which I will admit is a bit fair considering he was 17 in the first and is now 19 in this one. But still, he brings a very different flavour to Tatsuya that I don't think matches him all too much. But anyway, the game also lets you fast forward through cutscenes, which the first game did too. However, in the first game, you would just skip to the next line of dialogue every time you'd press a button. But now you just actually fast forward, so it sounds like this. Once you beat both games, you then get the ability to fully skip cutscenes, but it is kind of annoying that you can't do it before then. Something else that I think is funny that I thought to mention because of that Like a Dragon 8 trailer, even though it was a while ago now, but whenever I watch Japanese shows, movies, or play Japanese games, every time they get some sort of foreigner to come on and speak English and confuse everyone, more often than not, they'll get someone who can, like, speak English, but you can very clearly tell it isn't actually an American or a British person or something like that. But I swear to God, yeah, because it's the only series where whenever they do that, they actually just get someone to speak full-on English. There's Andre Richardson from Yakuza 3, the foreigner asking for directions in Like a Dragon, and then recently that trailer for Infinite Wealth with all the Americans there. But then in the opening scene for Kuroyo 2, as Tatsuya is now apparently a boxer traveling the world beating people up, he finds himself in Las Vegas in a boxing match. And the announcer and the dude that he's fighting just speak full-on English, and when I heard that, I was just amazed. Which is weird to think, because I'm currently speaking fluent English. Despite the fact that Tatsuya is in Las Vegas at the start, he teleports back to Kamurocho, but that's okay because at least Infinite Wealth next year will take us to Hawaii, and I reckon they should definitely have Like a Dragon 9 be set in Australia so that Ichiban can fight kangaroos. Back on topic. The cutscenes, as you can tell, are still using the same visual style as the first games, and they're also quite long like the first game, or like any Yakuza game really, but still very entertaining. Something I enjoyed about Tatsuya in this game is that the man he ended up becoming at the end of the first game is the man that he is in this game. He's still got a bit of that cockiness within him, but throughout the first game he learned to be more mature and to be more understanding both of the world and the people around him, and his lessons that he learned stuck with him. And I bring that up because sometimes in the Yakuza game certain things just get forgotten, like Yagami and Judgment being all, damn this justice system sucks, and then in Lost Judgment he's all, damn this justice system sucks, and it's like, yeah you already knew that Yagami. Anyway, rather hilariously, they did a Yakuza 3 in this game in which they deleted the love interest from the last game, and they did a Yakuza like a dragon with the box art of the game, where if you had no idea who Tatsuya was, as these three other dudes are new, you would have no idea who's supposed to be the hero or villain, or even who you get to play as, compared to the epic Kuroyo 1 box art where it has the main playable character and the 10 very important battles behind him. But I mean, whatever, it's not really important. Also, a lot of the songs in the cutscenes, funnily enough, are a bunch of the battle themes from the first game, and speaking of the soundtrack, it's time to move on to the soundtrack. <laughs> 
which once again is an absolute banger. It still has people like Hyde Lunch and Hideki Naganuma, but Hidenori Shoji actually had nothing to do with the game. However, this was the first appearance of one of my favorite composers for the Yakuza franchise being Zenta. He did a few songs for this game, such as a popular Majima karaoke song, but he also did one of the best songs ever called Little Revenge that goes so hard that you could use that as a rock to smash a window. Unfortunately, I feel like some of the songs aren't as good as the first games, but then conversely, some of the songs are way better than the first. Overall, it has the same sort of level of quality, but I do kind of prefer the first game soundtrack over the second. Final thing I want to mention with this game is, well, how to play it. On an actual PSP, the load times are quite shit, takes forever to save, and for some reason, the game likes to lag a lot more than the first game. Then if you play it on a PS Vita, it performs considerably better, but it still will occasionally lag. Finally, you can emulate it on a PSP emulator, but at least on PPSSPP emulator. There are some times where an enemy is chasing after you and you have to run away, but they'll always catch up to you. So what you have to do to prevent that is go into an INI file somewhere and change your frame rate to like 20, and then it'll work fine. The game also, as you can see, is only in Japanese. At the time of this recording, unlike the first game, there does exist a completed English patch for the game, but I never used it. All in all, while I felt that Kuroyo 1 had some elements that were better, I feel the general gameplay of Kuroyo 2 is a lot smarter. Whether this intelligence actually makes the game more fun is up to a more subjective opinion, but regardless, it is still very fun. Once again, I could recommend this to just sort of anyone, even if they're not a Yakuza fan. It's a lot of fun for a small handheld game, and it is a pretty big shame that I'll never see the light of day ever again. But in any case, I hope you enjoyed the video, and if you did, then you can grab the video, throw it into a friendly NPC, and do a team heat action on the like button with you and your mate, or some bullshit, I don't know, subscribe and join the channel, easy peasy. I hope you look forward to the next video, which is the second revolution for the series that simultaneously almost spelt the end of the franchise for all Western enjoys of the game, being Yakuza 5.